السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق أجمعين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وذكر فإن الذكرى تنفع المؤمنين وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون ما أريد منهم من رزق وما أريد أن يطعمون إن الله هو الرزاق ذو القوة المتين God says and remind them O Prophet for truly the reminder benefits the believers I did not create the jinn and humankind except to worship me I desire no provision from them nor do I desire that they should feed me Truly, God is the provider, the possessor of strength, the firm. Aminna billah, sadaqallahu al-aliyu al-azim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Once again, let us enliven our hearts and minds in gathering with the remembrance of the Holy Prophet and his purified progeny. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Who or what is God? How ought God to be recognized and to worship, to be worshipped? Some of us may have asked this question ourselves. Who is God? Or what is God? How do we describe God? If someone were to ask me who is God or what is your God, how would I describe this God? How would I try to convince this person to understand what God is? What is my conception of God? And how is it that this God ought to be recognized and ought to be worshipped? This is a question that many of us may have asked ourselves. We may have tried to answer ourselves. And certainly countless individuals over the course of human history have tried to answer this question and tried to provide a way to understand who or what God is. What are God's attributes? How do we understand God? And how is it that we ought to interact with God? What should our relationship be with God? To answer this question tonight, I want to turn to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Imam Ali who, among many other things, is the masterful theologian. We describe Imam Ali as Mawla al-Muwahideen. Mawla al-Muwahideen means the master of the monotheists, those who believe in God. He is the master of the monotheists. He is the masterful theologian we turn to his wisdom in order to understand God because Imam Ali understood God very well the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad he tells him one day he tells Imam Ali he says Ya Ali ma araf Allah illa ana wa an Tells him, Ali, no one knows me better than God and you. And no one knows you better than God and me. And no one knows God better than me and you. The Prophet tells us that Imam Ali understood God very well. Imam Ali alayhi salam understood and recognized God. He is Mawla al muwahideen He is the master theologian. He is the master worshipper. 
And when we read the teachings of Imam Ali, we find that he paints for us a detailed picture, an exquisite picture of God, of who God is, of what God is, and of our relationship, the relationship of humans to God. Just take a look at Nahjul Balagha. Nahjul Balagha, we know this all, but it's good to remember. Nahjul Balagha is a treasure chest, a treasure chest of beautiful wisdom and inspiration. In every word that appears, in every sermon, in every letter that Imam Ali wrote, in every sermon that he gave, in every short statement that he proclaimed, there is great wisdom. There is great wisdom. And it's a great tragedy that many of us are completely ignorant of Nahjul Bala. Najul Balagha has no place in our libraries, in our understanding. This is a travesty, brothers and sisters, no less than a travesty. Because it's like having access to a treasure chest, but never touching it, but never opening it. Come to Najul Balagha and look at how Imam Ali defines God, what he says about God. In Sermon 64, just one example I'll share with you tonight. We don't have time. If we want to use Nahj al-Balagha and explore everything that the Imam has said, has said about God, we would need several nights. But just one example from Sermon 64 in Nahj al-Balagha, where Imam Ali provides an impeccable description of God. He says, praising God, he says, Alhamdulillah alladhi lam tasbiq lahu halun hala fayakuna awwalan qabla an yakuna akhira. He says, praise be to God for whom one condition does not precede another condition so that he may be the first before the last. What does this mean? Me and you, me and you, our conditions are successive. If I were to say that I was the first one here at the center tonight, that means that I cannot be the last one here at the center. You're either first or you're last. You're either first or last. If you're last, that means someone came before you, someone else is first. If you're first, that means someone else is last. Imam Ali says, praise be to God for whom one condition does not precede another. With God, one condition, unlike us, does not come before the other. And thus, we can say God is first and God is last. God is first. And this is specific to God. Because all of us, our, con our conditions, they precede one another. We cannot be first and last at the same time. But God can be first and last at the same time simultaneously. He says, Imam Ali continues, he says, كُلُّ مُسَمَّنْ بِالْوَحْدَةِ غَيْرَهُ قَلِيلٌ Everyone other than him who is described as one, we say God is one, right? Everyone other than God who is described as one is small in number. God is the only being who when we describe him as one, we're not talking about a small number. كل مسمى بالوحدة غيره قليل وكل عزيز غيره ذليل and everyone other than him who is described as honorable is actually subservient doesn't matter you can be as honorable as you want to be be the best in society have the highest station in society but in relation to God, you remain subservient. God is the only one who is absolutely honorable. Never subservient. وَكُلُّ عَزِيزٍ غَيْرُهُ ذَلِيلٍ وَكُلُّ قَوِيٍ غَيْرُهُ ضَعِيفٍ And everyone besides God who is described as being strong is actually weak. Actually weak. Look at the human being. Doesn't matter. You can spend your whole life bodybuilding, but a virus can come and destroy your body. 
you can lift you know, lots and lots of weights, you can be very strong, you can be the strongest person on earth, but in the end, our physical bodies remain what? They remain weak. God is the only one who is truly powerful, who has absolutely no weakness. Imam Ali then goes on to say, وَكُلُّ مَالِكٍ غَيْرُهُ مَمْلُوكٍ and everyone who is described as a master, as an owner, besides God, is actually owned. How many of us own things in this life? We own properties, we own vehicles, we own clothes, we own other items. But in the end, no matter what kind of owner I am, in the end I am still a slave. I am owned to, by God. God owns me. doesn't matter what kind of owner I am. In the end, I am still owned. وَكُلُّ مَالِكٍ غَيْرَهُ مَمْلُوكٍ وَكُلُّ عَالِمٍ غَيْرُهُ مُتَعَلِّمٍ And everyone, everyone who is described as a knower, as knowledgeable besides God, is actually still learning. Absolute knowledge belongs only to God. Everyone else cannot claim to have absolute knowledge. No matter what degree, no matter how much you've read, no matter what you've memorized, you still do not have absolute knowledge. Absolute knowledge belongs only to God. And then he says, وَكُلُّ قَادِرٍ غَيْرُهُ يَقْدِرُ وَيَعْجَزُ And everyone described as having control besides God is sometimes able and sometimes unable. If I say that I have the capacity to, to do something, I have power, I have control. Is this power absolute? It's not absolute. Sometimes I have the ability and sometimes I am unable. Whereas absolute control and power lies with Allah. And then he goes on to say, he says, لَمْ يَخْلُقْ مَا خَلَقَهُ لِتَشْدِيدِ سُلْطَانٍ وَلَا تَخَوُّفٍ مِنْ عَوَاقِبِ زَمَانٍ وَلَا اسْتِعَانَةٍ عَلَى نِدِّي مثاور ولا شريك مكاثر ولا ضد منافر or ولا ضد منافر he says God did not create the creation to fortify his authority nor for fear of the consequences of time nor to seek help against the attacks of an equal or a boastful partner or a hateful opponent sometimes sometimes we do things because we are trying to counter the actions of someone else. We are trying to compete with someone else, right? We find this, you see this a lot of times with politicians. You see this with nations, with empires. If my neighbor has acquired these particular weapons, this military, I have to also have a similar or better or more powerful military. Why? Because I'm, keep, I'm competing with someone else. If he has this much land, I have to have more land because I'm competing with him. Right? If my neighbor has this size home, then I have to have a bigger home because I'm competing with my neighbor. Our actions many times are in competition with someone else, either a friend or maybe an enemy. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the entire creation and has everything without need to prove himself to anyone. Because he has no partner, no equal. He has no one that is uh, his opponent or his partner. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, he describes for us what it means to understand God. What it means to recognize God, who God is. And this is an impeccable description of God. This is a description of God that is truly worthy of being called and considered the Lord of the universe. But Imam Ali is not just the masterful theologian. Imam Ali alayhi salam is also the profound worshipper. Not only does Imam Ali teach us what it means to understand and recognize God, but also what it means to worship God in humility. And thus we find that out of all of the early companions of the Prophet, his early followers, 
Imam Ali, out of all of them, Imam Ali was the purest in worship. Because Imam Ali alayhi salam, and all historians accept this. There is no disagreement. Imam Ali, out of the early companions and followers of the Prophet, was the only one who never bowed down to an idol. He never worshipped an idol. And this is why the Muslims, all schools of thought, when they talk about Imam Ali, they say, Imam Ali karramallahu wajha. May God be pleased and honor his face. Why? Because his, his face, it never prostrated before an idol. Others did. Others were idol worshippers. They were polytheists. And then they accepted Islam. Imam Ali alayhi salam, never one day did he bow down before an idol. Thus, Imam Ali's worship of God was absolutely the purest worship of God. It was unadulterated. It was absolutely pure. From the moment of his birth. And how not? When God honored him and blessed him with being born in God's house itself, in the Kaaba itself. But rather, it was the Kaaba that was honored with having Amir al Mu'mineen being born in it. Thus, his worship was absolutely pure. And this is why he tells us, he says, Ilahi ma'abattuka khawfan min narik wa la tama'an fi jannatik walakin wajattuka ahlan lil ibadati fa'abattuka. My Lord, I do not worship you out of hope for reward, nor out of fear for punishment. Me and you, why do we worship God? What pushes us to worship God? In many cases, I speak about myself. In many cases, I worship God because I have a hope for God's reward. Because I know God has promised those who worship Him great rewards. They will have paradise and all of the rewards that are included with that in the hereafter. Or because I fear that if I do not worship Him, that I will be punished. Many times, this is what we teach our children, huh? If you don't pray, God is going to punish you. If you don't fast, God is going to punish you. A lot of times, this is how we teach, how we socialize one another. Our perception of God is a God that either rewards or punishes. And this is what incentivizes most of us to worship God. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, I don't worship God for hope of reward. Nor do I worship God for fear of punishment. Then why? How? How is it? Why, why do you worship God? Oh, Amir al mumini he says, وَلَكِنْ وَجَدْتُكَ أَهْلًا لِلْعِبَادَةِ فَعَبَدْتُكَ I found you only to be suitable for worship and thus I worship you. You're the only being that is worthy of worship. You're the only being that is suitable for worship and it is for this reason that I worship you, my Lord. And this is the best and the purest form of recognition and worship of God. That which is unconditional. You see in our lives, in our daily lives, when we talk about love, we talk about love between individuals, between family members, between spouses, between parents and children, between siblings, between friends. We know that the purest, that the purest and that the most desirable form of love is unconditional love, right? When we talk, often we talk about the love of parents to their children. We often say that a parent's love to their children is unconditional and this is the most desirable and it's the purest love because it's without condition. Because it's not dependent on what you're going to give me. I love you unconditionally. Not based on my benefits, what you can offer me, what you can give me. And this is something that we all seek. Do we not all seek pure, unconditional love? We do. Because that's the most desirable. And similarly, pure, unadulterated recognition and worship of God, unconditional worship of God, is the best and the purest form of worship. But unconditional worship 
is hard, brothers and sisters. How many of us can stand up solidly and say, yes, I worship God like Amir al Mu'mineen? That I worship God not to seek rewards or not for the fear of punishment. Because for most of us, and again, I say this about myself, for most of us, this unconditional recognition and worship of God is very, very difficult. It's not easy. It's very difficult. We are so strongly attached to rewards, to expectations of rewards, and to material and physical fulfillment that unconditional worship becomes very difficult for us. We expect material, physical fulfillment. We're attached to it. Prophet Isa, may God's peace and blessings be upon him and upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He says, I tell you this in truth, with certainty, that those who are engrossed in this material world, that they're engrossed in it, right? that it is their most important concern, their material gains, their material desires. Those who are engrossed in this material world cannot and will not enjoy worship and its sweetness. This is what Prophet Isa alayhi salam says. They don't go together. If you're engrossed completely in this material world, then you will never enjoy the absolute pure sweetness of worship. So how was Imam Ali alayhi salam able to worship God unconditionally? It was because he was unattached to this world. He had no attachment to this material world. He says in Nahj al balagha he tells us, he says, Ala wa inna imamakum qad iktafa min dunyahu bi timrayh wa min tu'mihi bi qursayh. He says, your leader, speaking about himself, he's talking to his followers, he says, your leader, indeed, your leader, for him enough in this world, out of in this world, the material desires and gains of this world, it was enough for him to have only two outfits, two outfits, two coarse outfits, and two loaves of bread. This is what he says. He says, this was suitable. This is good enough for me. I can live my life if I just have two outfits to wear and two loaves of bread to eat, that's all I need. I don't expect anything else from the world. This is what Imam Ali alayhi salam tells us. Was Imam Ali, did he not have access to money? Was he poor? Was he not the Khalifa? Was he not the ruler of the entire Muslim empire? He had the entire Muslim treasury at his disposal. People used to bring him gifts. He used to work himself. He used to make money. It wasn't that he was absolutely poor, but that he was not attached to this material world. Imam Ali, he defines for us as this pure ascetic. He defines for us. He tells us what zuhd is, what asceticism is. He says asceticism, zuhd, is not that you do not own anything in the world, but that Nothing that you own, owns you. It's not that you do not own anything, but it's that nothing owns you. This is what it means to be unattached to the world. It's, you're not controlled by the world. You're not controlled by material and physical desires. Sometimes we find ourselves controlled, completely controlled. We talk about being free. I have freedom. I'm strong because I have freedom, I can do and I can think and I can behave however I want. But many times we find ourselves that we are slaves to those things that own us, to our material gains. So Imam Ali alayhi salam says, this is what is suitable and enough for me from this world. And then he says, أَلَا وَإِنَّكُمْ لَا تَقْدِرُونَ عَلَىٰ ذَلِكَ He says, and I know my dear followers that you are not able to do this. I know this is difficult for you. I know it's difficult for you to emulate your imam. So what can we do? He says, 
ألا وإنكم لا تقدرون على ذلك ولكن أعينوني بورع واجتهاد وعفة وسداد You might not be able to emulate me, the Imam says, but at least you can help me as my followers. You can assist me by doing four things. These four things. What are they? He says, number one, that you exhibit wara. Wara is to have piety or precaution, a sense of moral and ethical precaution that stems from a mindfulness of God. Not to be risky when it comes to your ethical behavior. You know, taking risks and being adventurous is often considered a good thing in our society, right? They tell you it's good. If you're adventurous, that's a great thing. It might be good when it comes to business, when it comes to other aspects of life, travel and so on and so forth, to be adventurous, to be a risk taker. But when it comes to my ethics and my morals, that's not a good thing. Being adventurous and a risk taker is not a good thing. In fact, it's a good thing for me to be precautious in order to maintain my ethics, my values, and my morals. So he says, number one, assist me with number one, with exhibiting wara, to be cautious. When the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, when he describes, introduces the holy month of Ramadan in his sermon, the famous sermon that he recites at the end of the month of Sha'ban, welcoming the month of Ramadan, after he describes all of the beauties and bounties of the month, Imam Ali alayhi salam, his companions, including Imam Ali alayhi salam, they ask him, Ya Rasulullah, what is the best action that we can do during the month of Ramadan? And the Prophet, he replies, he says, al wara an maharim illah. The best thing that you can do is to avoid doing those things that displease God. To be precautious. To have that sense of piety that stems from mindfulness of God. That you keep God in your mind. That we have God's pleasure and God's satisfaction as our objective in life. So number one, al wara To exhibit piety and precaution when it comes to our akhlaq, our ethics, our morals. Number two, he says, wajtihad. Ijtihad is what? Ijtihad is diligence and effort. When you put in all of your effort in something. Imam Ali alayhi salam teaches us not to be lazy. Don't be lazy. Don't take life easily. When you engage in an act, when you do something, it, whatever it may be in life, it could be your school, your education, it could be your relationships, it could be your work, whatever it may be, to take it seriously. And to exhibit due diligence and to put all of your efforts into that act that you perform. Even if it's a small act, the ahadith, they remind us that when we perform an act, the best act is one that is done sincerely and completely, even if it's a small act. So Imam Ali alayhi salam says, help me in exhibiting wara, piety, and ijtihad, diligence. Put in effort when it is that you work, whatever you may do, put in your entire effort. Number two. Number three, wa'iffa, and be modest. Be modest. Iffa is often translated as modesty. Be modest when it comes to what you consume. Our consumption, the food, the drink, our purchases, the things that we buy, our spending of money to be modest. Not to be frugal, no, no. There's a difference between being frugal and being modest. Being modest means that you are not wasteful, that you do not waste. It's important, of course, to be generous, but that we do not waste. So when it comes to our consumptions, and the Quran reminds us of this, Kulu washrabu wa la tusrifu. Eat and drink, but do not do what do not overdo it. Do not be wasteful. Sometimes we find ourselves being wasteful, brothers and sisters. Wasteful. The average American buys much more 
than he or she is able to consume. You go to the store and you just buy everything, especially if it's the month of Ramadan, huh? You're hungry in the afternoon and you want to eat everything in the store, so you buy and buy and buy. Now it's fine if you consume it and your family consumes it. The problem is when it is wasted and most of it gets wasted. This is what it means to have modesty, that we do not waste. Yes, if the food, if that which we have is more than we need, we should distribute it, give it to others, but never waste the food. And when it comes to our interactions, not just what we consume, but when we interact with one another, we should interact with one another in modesty. Modesty. Be mindful of the other side. Be mindful of the way that you interact with one another. Make sure that when you speak to others, you speak to others pleasantly. Not in a way that is hurtful or harmful. This is Iffa. And number four, finally, was Sadat. Sadat is overall success, integrity. To be truthful, to be genuine. Not ha to have a gap between your inner being and your outer actions. That there is integrity and that there is truth. And so Imam Ali alayhi salam says, you can't live like me. You might not be able to worship God like me or live a life of modesty like me. However, assist me in these things. Assist me. Biwara'in wa ijtihad wa iffatin wa sadat. Imam Ali alayhi salam spent his entire life all the way until his death in sublime recognition and worship of God. Every waking moment from his birth until his death Imam Ali embodied what it means to be a true servant of God. One who truly understands, recognizes God, and worships God, and expresses devotion to God. There are so many stories from the life of Imam Ali that exhibit, just take a look at some of his supplications, some of his du'as that we recite. Look at du'a Kumail, Kumail ibn Ziyad, this beautiful du'a that we recite on Thursday nights. Look at how Imam Ali alayhi salam speaks to God. Look at Dua al Sabah. Recite Dua al Sabah. Look at how Imam Ali speaks to God, how he devotes attention to God. Look at Munajat Amir al Mu'mineen. How Imam Ali alayhi salam devotes himself to God. Abu Darda, a companion, relates one day a story from Imam, one of Imam Ali's devotions, one of his invocations, one of his prayers. Abu Darda says that one day I was walking, I was looking for Amir al Mu'mineen. I was looking for him. Imam Ali sometimes he would isolate himself from the community. He would go and he would spend time alone in isolation, speaking to God, praying to God, invoking God. So Abu Darda says, I went looking for Imam Ali, I could not find him. I figured that he might have gone home. This was out in public. He might have gone home. So I began to walk. Suddenly, I heard a sound, a voice, a very sad voice, a voice that was crying and weeping. He says, I proceeded towards and I saw Imam Ali sitting next to a tree. And he was crying and weeping. And he had his hands to the sky. And he was praying to his Lord, imploring his Lord. He says, I heard him say, Ilahi, kam min mubiqatin halimta an muqabalatiha biniqmatik. My Lord, Imam Ali alayhi salam, in a very sad tone, he was reciting, he said, My Lord, how many serious offenses have I committed that you have tolerated versus expressing wrath towards me? How many times have I made a mistake? How many serious offenses have I committed? But rather than punish me with your wrath, O oh my Lord, you tolerated them. 
you expressed clemency towards me. You tolerated my serious misgivings. Ilahi kam min mubiqatin halimta an muqabalatiha bi niqmatik wa kam min jariratin takarramta an kashfiha bi karamik. O my Lord, and how many faults did I commit that you did not expose me with? How many mistakes, how many wrongdoings did I do? I did them in secrecy, but oh my Lord, you never exposed me. You expressed kindness to me. Out of your kindness, you kept my faults a secret. You did not expose me upon others. Ilahi in tala fi asyanika umri. وَعَظُمَا فِي الصُّحُفِ ذَنْبِ My Lord, He says, if my life is prolonged in disobedience, I spend many, many years disobeying you, my Lord. And that my sins in your record are great. إِلَاهِ إِن طَالَ فِي عَصْيَانِكَ عُمُرِي وَعَظُمَا فِي الصُّحُفِ ذَنْبِي فَمَا أَنَا بِمُؤَمَّلٍ غَيْرِ غُفْرَانِكْ وَلَا أَنَا رَاجٍ غَيْرَ رِضْوَانِكْ If I spend my life with prolonged sinfulness and wrongdoing and disobedience and my sins are great with you, my Lord, however, this will not stop me, my Lord, for having immense hope in your forgiveness. I will always have hope in your forgiveness, Imam Ali alayhi salam says. I will always anticipate your pleasure and your mercy. This is Imam Ali alayhi salam. He teaches us what it means to have a merciful God, a compassionate God, what it means to spend time seeking God's forgiveness and compassion and mercy. He spent his entire life all the way until his final moments. Ya Amir al Mu'mini. On the 19th eve of the month of Ramadan, a night like tonight, in Kufa, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he had fasted during the day. He was at the home of Umm Kulthum, his daughter. The traditions, they say that after Lady Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, after she passed away. Of course, Imam Ali had made a promise to her that he would take care of their children. They had lost their mother when they were young. And Imam Ali did all he could to take care of his children. During the months of Ramadan, during the nights of the month of Ramadan, he would go from one of his children's homes to another, spend each night with one of his children to break his fast with them tonight, he was in the home of Umm Kulthum. The traditions say that Maghrib arrived, the time of sunset came, Imam Ali alayhi salam stood before his Lord to, to recite his prayers. And then afterwards he came to sit down to break his fast. Umm Kulthum, the tradition says, had brought for him a small platter with a loaf of bread and a bowl of milk and some salt. She placed it before her father, Amir al muminin Imam Ali alayhi salam. He looked up at his daughter, Umm Kulthum. He told her, my beloved Umm Kulthum, when have you ever seen me eat two different types of food? When have you ever seen me eat two different types of food? My beloved daughter, take this food. Take one of these items away from me. I don't need this food, this excessive food that you've brought for me. The tradition says that Umm Kulthum, she knelt down to take the salt, to remove the salt. He said, no, keep the salt and take the milk, take the yogurt. And that night, Amir al muminin he broke his fast on bread and salt. This was Amir al muminin This was the worshiper of Allah. 
this was the humble Imam. Afterwards, the tradition says, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he stood up and he began to engage in prayers and acts of worship. And he would spend his nights in the month of Ramadan in worship. The entire night he would spend in worship, he would only spend a little bit of time sleeping. One day, a person was asked, a person asked about the worship of Imam Ali during the month of Ramadan. How does God, Imam Ali worship during the month of Ramadan? And the reply was that Imam Ali's worship during the month of Ramadan was no different than any other month. It didn't make a difference for him. He would spend every night in worship and devotion to God. And so he spends many hours in recitation of the Quran and in his prayers and his devotion the tradition says, then he went to rest for a little bit of the night. But he kept waking up. He woke up and he would pronounce, he would say, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون The tradition says he got up, he went into the courtyard, and then he looked up into the night sky. And then he pronounced, he said, Hiya, hiya, wallahi layla tillati wa adaniha Rasulillah. My beloved messenger of God, my beloved cousin and messenger and brother, he promised me a particular night that a particular night would come, and by Allah, this is that night that he promised to me. The tradition then says he went and he continued with his acts of worship until the time of Fajr came, dawn. And he got up to leave, to go to the masjid. Some of the traditions say that as he was passing by in the courtyard, he was going to leave the house of Umm Kulthum. There were geese in the courtyard and they began to scream. They began to call out as though they can feel their Imam. He's leaving and he has no return. They began to scream. Imam Ali alayhi salam said there will be weeping after these screams, after these cries. And then he began to call out, Ushdud hayazi makalil maut. Fa in al maut ala qika wala tajza min al maut. Ida halla biwadika. He reminds himself, he says, Oh Ali, prepare yourselves. Prepare yourself for your final departure. There is no running away from this final time. The tradition then says, Amir al muminin he went out, he went to the mosque of Kufa, and there in the mosque of Kufa, some people, they were engaged in worship, others were waiting, some were asleep, Ibn Muljam was waiting. Ibn Muljam was waiting for Amir al muminin there, the tradition says that Imam Ali alayhi salam, he got up and he went towards the mihrab, the prayer niche, and he stood there and he began to call the Muslims to prayer, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, calling the Muslims for in preparation to stand before their Lord in prayer. And then he began his prayers. As he began his prayers, the cursed Ibn Muljam, he got up, he had his poisonous sword, he waited for Imam Ali alayhi salam. Look at this cowardice. Imam Ali, can anyone stand face to face against Imam Ali? He chose a time where he knew Imam Ali would be completely engrossed in his Lord, not aware of what's happening around him. As Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, as he was in the state of sujood, Subhan Rabbi al A'la wa bihamd, he raises his head from sujood. Ibn Muljam comes and he strikes Imam Ali alayhi salam on his head with the poisonous sword. Allahu Akbar. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he falls. At this moment, he calls out for that final and ultimate victory. How many victories did Imam Ali alayhi salam have on the battlefield? Every time he was victorious, but it was not until this final time, this final act of victory, that when he was struck, he called out by the Lord of the Kaaba, I am victorious. Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلَبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ 
وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Brothers and sisters, tonight, as you know, is the first of a series of Liyali al-Qadr, the nights of Qadr, the nights of power. These nights are very important. These are special nights. The Qur'an tells us that the night of Qadr is greater than a thousand months. Our acts of worship, the time that we spend with our Lord tonight, speaking to our Lord, supplicating, invoking our Lord, this is a very special night. This is a time that we should spend in worship, in seeking forgiveness, in turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and imploring Allah to bestow His mercy and His compassion upon us and to pray during this night, inshallah, we will be performing very shortly some of the a'mal together. There are many a'mal for Laylatul Qadr, but together here as a community, we will be performing the two rak'ah prayers, inshallah, which is recommended. And I'll give you more details about this as we do them. But the two rak'ah prayer, inshallah, followed by the dua of the Qur'an, holding the Qur'an and placing on our heads, followed, inshallah, by dua al-Jawshan al-Kabir. These are some of the main uh, acts of worship that we will be performing tonight together. But beyond that, brothers and sisters, it's recommended, of course, to recite the Qur'an, to seek istighfar, to perform Salatul Layl, and to give charity, and to spend this night in devotion to Allah. And I also remind you, brothers and sisters, that Zakatul Fitrah on the day of Eid uh, is wajib, of course. We know the amount of Zakatul Fitrah, as in previous years, is $15. If you want to uh, contribute to that, you're more than welcome to do that, inshallah. Uh, I uh, ask you please to remember me and my family in your du'as. Uh, we remember all of those who are sick, all, the, uh, all who are ill, all who has, have asked us to pray for them. And inshallah, we recite uh, Surah Al-Fatiha for the souls of all of the mu'mineen and mu'minat. With a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <laughs>